It's now my uh, great pleasure to uh, welcome you to the afternoon session. And we have the honor of, of being joined by um, Jeremy Farrar, who is the director of the Wellcome Trust. He has um, a long bio listing many accomplishments um, with nearly 500 uh, contributions to research papers, uh, amongst many others. And so uh, with his involvement from the Wellcome Trust and his past history in, in involvement in research, he's very qualified to be tackling the difficult question around Ebola and research and humanitarian organisations. And I'd really like to welcome Jeremy to take the stage. So thanks very much uh, for the introduction. Um, and and uh, I know everyone says this when they start a talk, but it is a, a, a real privilege to come and speak at, at this event. And I'm only really going to say one thing today. And so after I've said this, you can leave or go to sleep. Um, I think there is a, a unique is a big word, but I think there is a unique opportunity between what has been relatively siloed communities but who share a great deal of common ethos and, and philosophy to come closer together. And, and if that's the single thing I say today, we can stop now and go away. What I want to extend is, is how coming over the coming days, weeks, and months, and years, the MSF family, if that's the right word for it, with all its challenges within a family, and the Wellcome Trust, which has its own challenges within a family, may seek to work more closely together. So thanks very much. <laughs> so this was me. Uh, it's very, I think it, it is important. I think history is very important. Um, sorry, I don't know if this works or how I work it. Technical challenges. There we go. That's, uh, that's me um, some years ago, um, 1960X. And I'm not <laughs> giving any more details. Um, I actually discovered the Acropolis, but, but that's a, a different one. <laughs> I was born in Asia and then uh, was dragged around as the youngest of six children with an uh, English teaching father um, uh, and an artist as a mother through, through many countries um, which uh, have been through their own challenges. And, and, and the reason why I think that is important and important to the current discussion and, and important in the way I see, uh, I hope, the way the Wellcome Trust itself is going to go is that, that, that that experience as a child, I think, leaves very, very deep memories to you. And, and, and growing up in places uh, uh, like the Yemen and, and in Libya and, and in other places apart the world really leaves a very uh, profound influence on you. And it's something that I certainly wish to bring to the Wellcome Trust, to see the Wellcome Trust as an outward-looking global organization wanting to contribute to global health uh, and not as just a UK-based institution looking inward uh, to a single uh, country. I came to the UK when I was a teenager, uh, studied medicine at, at University College uh, London, uh, then worked, did most of my postgraduate training in Edinburgh and in Melbourne, uh, had a, a year in San Francisco uh, as part of a PhD at, at Oxford, and was destined to become a neurologist in the UK, that's what I trained in, um, before in an audience very similar to this, and I hope it hasn't the same effect on me, uh, in Norwich at the Association of British Neurology, and about this stage in the talk, looked up at the audience and thought, I don't want to work with you lot for the rest of my life. <laughs> Apologies to neurologists in the audience. <laughs> so I left neurology, and in those days one could do this. One could go between specialties, sadly lost in global medical and other training. Uh, and going back to actually to Oxford the next day, and the fact that the lab I was working in was next door to the malaria lab, and happened to have a coffee with somebody who said, there's an opportunity coming up in Vietnam, and, and they might be looking for somebody with some of, some of your, your skills, and would you be interested? And from that moment onwards, moved to Vietnam with the thought that I would be there for about one or two years and come back to a migraine clinic in Edinburgh, uh, stayed for 18 years, and came back uh, for some reason about a year ago, 18 months ago. 
Everything I'm going to say is therefore very influenced and coloured by the experiences in Vietnam. I was, uh, then became the head of clinical research unit based in what I think is the largest infectious disease hospital in the world, the Hospital of Tropical Diseases, Ho Chi Minh City, somewhere between 600 and 1,000 beds dedicated to infectious diseases, government public hospital in the centre of uh, Saigon, Ho Chi Minh City. I won't go through all the individuals, but, but perhaps just to pick out one, a very young-looking Professor Hian here, who is uh, soon to retire, actually, but probably has been the most important mentor in, in my life. I swapped that uh, in October 2013 um, from the beauty of Hue in central Vietnam and the, the beauty of uh, a big Asian city, uh, Ho Chi Minh City, um, for a wonderful commute. Um, uh, on a daily basis from Oxford into Paddington Station. Um, uh, a pleasure, a pleasure. Um, <laughs> and I haven't stopped thinking what a pleasure that's been ever since. <laughs> so I came back to Britain after having been out of the UK for 18 years and actually having only spent uh, less, certainly less than half my life uh, here. So it's been a major cultural, professional and personal uh, uh, challenge moving back. Uh, but the reason I did so, um, and this is not meant to sound too hubristic, but I think the Wellcome Trust actually is a very, very important organisation. And I think if it can work with partners in collaboration and takes this global perspective, I think we can contribute in a way that goes beyond what we've uh, achieved to date. And that is my aim. I'm a clinician. Uh, I trained as a neurology, I said, but, but I never trained formally in infectious diseases, and, and I'm sure many in the audience will notice that with some of my advice over the last year or so. But, but I did do, and I did until September 2013, a ward round every day, uh, essentially around the more sort of intensive care of, uh, severe, uh, of, of infectious diseases. And this was the spectrum of diseases uh, that was on the ward in, in the last few weeks that, of, of, that I left with patients with, with these diseases. Um, and what, perhaps one of the th uh, highlights of this for me is not necessarily the individual diseases, but is actually the, the, the top one. And it's something I'll come back to talk about in a moment. And the truth is, even in an extremely good hospital, in a, in a, in a well-supported public hospital in Ho Chi Minh City, the truth of the matter is that most things, we haven't got a clue what's going on. Uh, and, and that, I think, uh, is a huge, huge problem. Globally, global health is changing hugely. David used to look like this. And David increasingly looks like that. And that has implications for all of us. The world is changing. It's changing in all sorts of ways. Um, and infectious diseases and non-communicable diseases are starting to have an, uh, an overlap and an impact on each other, which we, we have not really witnessed through the history of, of medicine. So take dengue, for uh, example, a disease I know a lot about. Dengue in somebody looking like that is actually a very different disease to dengue in, in a disease looking like that. The pharmacology of the anti-malarial drugs that we give, the pharmacology of the antifungal drugs we give to individual patients or at a population level looks, looks very, very different. And one of the great challenges for health systems around the world, which is a crucial area, the challenge of health systems around the world is many low and middle income countries are quite well set up huge variability, but some of them quite well set up to deal with some of the challenges, and I'll come back to West Africa in a minute, but some of the challenges of acute infections in relatively young individuals where you come in very sick and in all honesty you go out with a treatment and you survive or you die and you die very quickly. The world is changing such that those infections are going to be hugely influenced by the rest of the environment and the societies they're in and by the rise of the non-communicable diseases. And the health systems that one needs to cope with the rise of the non-communicable diseases is actually quite a different system than one might need for dealing with the acute infectious diseases that many low and middle income countries are challenged by. And actually, the so-called developed world, the, the, the relatively rich world or the rich world, has in the main not had to deal with that coming together. So although it's not quite true, but the world did, uh, UK, United States, Western Europe, et cetera, did manage to reduce their burdens of infectious diseases as the non-communicable diseases rise. One of the huge challenges for lower middle income countries is how you deal with those two challenges together, both at an individual patient level and also as a health systems uh, level. 
and talk a little bit about emerging infections, and it, it, it actually underpins uh, the health systems comment I, I made earlier. The world is not equal in terms of where potential emerging infections may arise. There are undoubtedly hotspots, and you can map these, it's an old paper now, uh, but you can map these around the world, where you may think that the emergence of uh, major new issues, which will challenge the whole of society, are, are more likely to emerge. And this was actually a very, very nice uh, paper from a few years ago now, but it divided up the emergence of issues and trying to map them and uh, give some idea of where the, the complexities may arise into zoonotic pathogens uh, from wildlife, uh, from primates, for instance, zoonotic pathogens from non-wildlife, poultry, chickens, uh, etc. Uh, the uh, vector-borne diseases, um, uh, mosquito or tick, etc. And, and then, for me, the most important emerging infectious disease of our time, the arise and spread uh, of drug resistance. Which, which is going to have, in my view, the most profound impact on, on global emerging infections. What needs to happen to this sort of work is that one needs to overlay on top of this, not just uh, this descriptive and the nice maps that this demonstrates, but also the environment in which it's happening and how that's changing, the way societies are changing. Societies in West Africa are not the same as societies in the, the Democratic Republic of Congo in 1976, and therefore our response to events has got to change. Uh, and overlaying the way that these, uh, these uh, communities are interli interlinked with the rest uh, of the world. So the drivers of these emerging infections, and again, I put drug resistance as the most important emerging infectious issue of our, uh, of our time, are, are multifaceted. The recent terrible events uh, in Kathmandu, the recent events in, in West Africa, just demonstrate that these issues arise in, on, they do not arise in the absence of understanding the culture and the environment in which they're arising. So whether it be earthquakes, or whether it be war, or civil war, or, 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 or disconnects between the governed and the governing, uh, puts enormous challenges on the emergence of infections and the ability of the health systems to cope with it. So on top of the uh, hotspots around the world of where environmental factors may lead to the emergence of new emerging infections or drug resistance, et cetera, we have to overlay on top of that the ability and the uh, resilience of the systems that can cope with it. If we don't put those together, we won't understand where the risks and threats lie, and we won't be able to address the underlying issues. You cannot, in my view, separate these two. Uh, environmental and climate change will lead to many, many changes, some of them unpredictable, some of them predictable, but they will certainly have an impact, for instance, on, on, uh, on mosquito populations, stickborne, et cetera, will change in the, in the way they are spread around the world. And society itself is changing. We're going from uh, rural to an increasingly urban society, and the urban societies do act uh, anthropologically and interconnected where, in ways that, that, is, that is different. Uh, in the ways that, that rural communities act. And, and the drivers of this, I think, underpins many of the emergence and challenges we face with, with, with infections. Counterfeit drugs, crucial, crucial issue, I think, both in terms of individual patients and populations not getting the drugs they need, but also in the emergence of drug resistance. If you have a, a tablet, an injection, etc., with no drug in it, that's one thing. The individual will suffer dreadfully. If you have a, a counterfeit drug with 20% of the ingredients of the antibiotic, anti-malarial, anti-TB drug, anti-HIV drug, that's a second issue. If it's 50%, if it's 70%, if it's 90%, then this will have profound implications uh, for both uh, treating individual patients, the population in which they live, and the emergence of drug resistance. Zoonoses, obviously, um, I, I won't go into any more details. And lastly, of course, the interconnectivity. Uh, the ability, I first came to, to the UK, I got on a boat uh, in Asia, and I arrived in Southampton docks, uh, and I've supported Southampton ever since then, actually. Um, I arrived at Southampton docks six and a half, seven weeks later. If I'd got on with a dreaded lurgy in 1960, whatever, uh, 1970, whatever it was, I would have either have got over it by the time I arrived. Now, of course, you can be there in 12 hours. And I would imagine there's people in this room who yesterday were in some more distant, distant place. That is a, a, a potential uh, capacity for us to, to spread things around the world uh, much more uh, quickly than in previous eras. The other thing is these emerging issues happen very, very quickly. 
1918 was the thing we all are terrified by, the pandemic of 1918 with 20, 40, 50 million people killed in a, in a world with about 2 billion people at that stage. This is a, a very beautiful graph. This is uh, months of the year. This is October 1918. These are four cities, uh, New York, London, Paris, and Berlin. And the, the important thing here is this is mortality and this is excess mortality. And you can see that in individual cities, the upswing of that epidemic and the downswing, there were further waves across here, in individual places, that, that peak of that epidemic went up and came down very, very quickly. The take-home message for me in that is if we're going to act, we have to act in a speed which has hitherto been unthought of. We are now 15, 16, 17 months into the Ebola epidemic, and our capacity to respond to it, as MSF has led, is just not in the time frame that's consistent with where we have to be if we're going to act uh, more quickly. And, and again, whilst I believe that surveillance is absolutely critical and sharing of information and knowledge of what is and what is not happening is absolutely critical, the truth is surveillance picked up Ebola in January or February of 2014, and apart from MSF, the world did not act until August, September, October. So surveillance was in itself not the problem, it was our ability to act. If we don't add a response mode to our ability to gather the information, then we will continue to be, dare I say it, stamp collecting around the data. We have to add a, a, a component to it. This is Mexico, and the only reason for showing this of the pandemic is because it follows a very, very similar pattern. This is the center of Mexico in, 19, uh, in 2009. So when I look back, and I deliberately have not chosen Ebola to, to, to frame this talk on, and I've chosen something very different, but which I think has the same implications, and that's the pandemic of 2009. But actually, and, and, and not deliberately, but I have actually, uh, for reasons that escape me a little bit, been very directly involved in, in SARS. Carlo Urbani, who first uh, raised the issue of SARS in 2004, uh, and closed the hospital in Vietnam, which essentially saved the country from desperately suffering from the SARS epidemic and lost his life in doing so. Uh, very involved through SARS. Actually, it started with Nipah, 1998, H5N1, Intravirus 71 in Southeast Asia at the moment, viral hemorrhagic fevers, hemolytic uremic syndrome, H7N9 in China at the moment, cholera, mers cov drug resistance, and Ebola. And I have, in one way or another, been involved in all of these. I think in parts of the community, uh, we, people have improved dramatically. There is much better surveillance now than there was. In the old days, we would never have known H7N9 was appearing in China. Now we know of it. And in fact, in some ways, we have too much information now. You will know in 2015 if there is an HXNY influenza, avian influenza in outer Mongolia. You will, you will know, that will be picked up, I, I would imagine. Um, so I think the surveillance and actually the sharing of data can certainly be improved, but compared to where it was a decade ago, we are in a much, much better position. I actually think that international cooperation, but we can come back to that, ha has, been, has been reasonably good. And overall, although it's easy to criticise, I actually think the media have been involved in many of these in, 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 a, in actually mostly a positive, positive way. I think the community which has failed to step up to the mark is my community, and that is the patient-orientated research community. And I think because of fragmented services, and I believe a major component of stifling regulation and conservatism, we have not com co uh, combined with, uh, collaborated with, uh, the individuals working in other sectors such that we can start to do the essential work in that very short window one has to learn what one can do to make a difference. There are enormous practical, there's huge ethical, uh, there's huge questions about subsequent access to information, data, and samples, and huge access, uh, access to further treatment. But the window of opportunity to change epidemics is early in their natural history. And if we don't learn, have gained the ability to act at that time, I fear we keep, we'll keep going through the mistakes of all of these. MERS-CoV is a very good example. The first case of MERS-CoV, off the top of my head, was, was diagnosed actually in this city in September 2013. We are now in May 2015. We don't understand the epidemiology. We don't understand the animal reservoir. We don't understand the transmission dynamics. We have not worked out how to treat individual patients or prevent secondary transmission, and we do not have a vaccine. That's true of every one of these. 
So if you ask a very simple question, and I, just remind everyone, I'm a clinician, not an epidemiologist. Um, I'm a clinician. But if you ask for influenza, arguably one of the infectious diseases which could cause global catastrophe, if you ask the question for influenza, how do you, who do you treat, with which drug or not, at what dose and for how long, do we understand which drugs to use, understanding the pharmacology, the PKP day relationship, the interventions that may work beyond therapeutics uh, to prevent secondary transmission? How does resistance to the drugs that we do have develop? Uh, do we have uh, vaccines which cross more than, than, than a few strains? And, whether, and what works in the setting of, of a clinical setting? This is a disease which 16 to 20 percent of the world's population were infected by in 2009, uh, um, and yet out of that period, four years later, I don't believe we can answer uh, with general agreement and consensus the answer to any of, of these questions. And again, I think that has been true of every single uh, epidemic and pandemic that, that I refer to, to above. Such that at the end of 2013, the World Health Organization, in their great wisdom, were able to say overall the quality of the body of evidence was very low to low, leading to WHO global recommendations for the treatment of a hugely important infection, a strong recommendation, very low quality evidence. I am a native English speaker, <laughs> and I could not tell you what that would mean <laughs> as a clinician with a patient in front of me with flu. And that's not WHO's fault, in my view. That's the, my community's fault for not addressing that issue. Leading to guidelines, leading, sorry, to headlines uh, from, from a very esteemed, in some quarters, journal, British Medical Journal, stating very boldly that oseltamivir does not work. I'll go on. And part of the reason is, I believe, that stifling regulation and complexity and conservatism that we brought to, to human, what I call human subject research. This is a patient with something quite badly wrong with them. This is a youngish clinician who's got a bright idea. The pathway that that young clinician takes, probably early or mid in their career, when they're terrified of where their next job is, is to go and write a protocol. This is the previous drafts of the protocol. They're now on protocol version 563. They then, uh, and if ever, any of you have not watched the YouTube video on teleconferences, please email me and I'll send it to you. It is one of the funniest YouTube videos ever. They often then go to a teleconference. When we were living in Asia, that always included people in Europe and in North America. And for some reason, North Americans could never be out of bed in the middle of the night. So this was always at 2 AM, Asia time. Uh, you never really understood what anyone was saying. You couldn't hear what. Anyway, they seem to be very, very important in this whole process, which led to version 896. And this young doctor, clinician, nurse, whatever they are, then goes back. Anyway, by six, day 611, it's improved a little bit since then. Um, it's now 609. But, but this is the average time in 2011 that it took from bright idea to enrollment of a first patient in a clinical study trying to find out what was wrong with them or how best to treat them and their families or their communities. We don't have 611 days in the, in the emerging infectious disease world. Bear in mind that 42-day, six-week window when the epidemic curve often goes up and down and your greatest capacity to intervene is, is early on. And then finally, that's only to recruitment and, of course, uh, to completion of the study, writing it up, getting all the QDOS, presenting at a meeting, publishing the paper and moving on to your next job, takes you into a about day 1,000, which no young clinician would dream of going into if they had any sense. Uh, and that is one of the reasons why I think we're moving away from clinical research, which I think is so critical to uh, the future. So I believe health research, and particularly my area, uh, uh, human subject research, needs a new paradigm. Yes, we do have better surveillance now, and we will identify things. In fact, as I say, we will identify potentially too many, and we won't understand the biology to know whether HXNY in Outer Mongolia is going to cause a global pandemic or not. We have to get smarter in our surveillance. But we cannot think that surveillance on its own, without the ability to act, is going to sort out the problem. I think we need much more innovation in the design of research. We haven't moved human subject clinical study design on, in fact, in the last 20 to 30 years. And I think we even now, even now, in the events in West Africa, we are still having 
uh, in my view, sterile arguments about designs of studies and how one might do things. We can't do that in the context uh, of an epidemic. We have to have much, much better appreciation of the, of the views and, and perspectives of the community uh, that we're working with, and that means very culturally uh, sensitive times. I'm going to move on very quickly because I don't want to talk about Ebola because uh, I know you dealt with that very quickly. 1947 was the setting up of the major global agencies, whether they be the United Nations World Health Organization, the International Monetary Fund and others. And I think there is a major question of what the role of all of these agencies in and their governance structure in a world that looks very different to when we had Yugoslavia uh, as, a, as a member of that committee. The world has moved on and we need to move on the governance structures of that. We've tended to make things overly complicated. This is the view from Geneva, and yet on top of that, overlaying it, and partially because of our, all of our concerns about the global governance of health, we've invented new schemes and new systems and new infrastructures and new governance bodies, which looks to maybe supplant or take over from the World Health Organization, but which, in my view, don't have the legitimacy of representing national governments with all of the issues that, that comes from. I think we could much, much simplify uh, this. So yes, we need better surveillance, and we need to learn how to share that data in more real time. And critically, and this is not often talked about, we need to learn how to share the benefits of that research so that access to, to, the, to the benefits that accrue from this research becomes critically important. We've become much better at picking up things, but we must now learn how to act much more coherently and much more quickly. And my last slide goes back to my first point. And that is, I think there is a unique opportunity, and I appreciate the challenges, of bringing together your community who sees the world differently to others and, 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 and the community I am in and am now in and looking at ways about how we can bring those together because ultimately, actually, our underpinning philosophies and, and thinking are actually incredibly similar and there's huge overlap. I don't know how to do that. It won't happen today, but that is my dream for the, the, the coming months and years. How can we work these two communities more closely together because we're actually both after the same things? And I'll finish there. Thank you, Jeremy. We're going to have time for three questions. If you can't say your question in one sentence, don't put your hand up for the microphone, please. We're going to go to the online audience first. If you can put your hands up, and I'll pick out the other two now. A microphone here, please. And anyone else? Thank you very much. Um, I share your concern for bringing together communities that need to work together and have shared interests. Um, I wonder if you might have a comment about the complexity of that process and the balance between critical and friend in that cliche. Um, I'm thinking, I think your organization is under a little bit of pressure on fossil fuels right now, for instance. <laughs> uh, which one do you want me to ask? Fossil fuels or, or collaborative ventures? Um, comments on how to collaborate constructively okay. across silos, um, yep. getting the right balance between criticism and pushing people more and yeah. being supportive and friendly? So firstly, I, I think all organisations, MSF, Wellcome Trust, whoever you are, has to be thick-skinned enough to take criticism and, and, appreciate, and listen to it. And whether you change or not is, is for you to determine as you're listening. But I think you have to be thick-skinned enough to take criticism. Um, secondly, I think you will not build collaborations and, and harmony, if that's the right word, uh, by a top-down approach. I think the way to do it is to get a greater understanding at a depth within organisations such that actually this is driven by individuals and actually, to an extent, both the ethos of the organisation and the, and the individual chemistry between players across the organisation. I think that is the best way of building collaborations. Because at the moment, the language of both, not, not, I'm not saying our organisations, but many organisations not used to working together, the language is so different, it's actually quite difficult sometimes for those communities to come together. So I would not suggest a massive top-down approach that says A and B must work together in some ways. I would suggest we build this organically by, by increasing the number of interactions between our organisations such that that embeds it much bigger, better in both. Vicky. 
Thank you very much, Jeremy. I'm Vicky from MSF UK. Um, in terms of calling outbreaks earlier and therefore galvanizing a, a faster response, I think MSF's experience is that it's actually governments who are the impediment to that. So they are the ones who are reluctant to recognize this nature and scale of an outbreak for whatever reason. But at the same time, they are the members, if you like, of the global health architecture, WHO, et cetera, as you, as you refer to. How do we unpick that? How do we, um, how do we, yeah, how do we prevent governments or, or, or avoid them actually being the ones that are the obstacle yeah. to, to recognizing the outbreak in the first place? Obviously a huge issue, and I, and I don't want to give it a sort of glib, very short answer because I don't want to underestimate the complexity of it, but I think the bottom line comes to the word incentive. I think at the moment there are massive, massive disincentives for countries to do what you've described. Even to the point that uh, uh, Spanish flu is how it was called. Spain, was almost, for 100 years, has now been blamed with that epidemic. The only reason was, of course, because the press in Spain were free. They were able to report it. German, British, American press was censored. Spain has forever le left with that sense that this was all Spain's fault. <laughs> Talk to anybody in Indonesia, and they will tell you they have the same with bird flu. I personally would like to get away from naming new viruses under the river or the country from which they come. We've got to change the discourse from one of disincentive, whether it be your economy's going to collapse, uh, you're going to have airplanes that are going to stop flying to you, your tourist industry is gone, to one where there's some incentives uh, built into the system such that transparency and honesty is rewarded rather than, rather than trashed. Right up the back. Jeremy, hi, Marion Turner from Nature. Um, you said right at the end that sharing the results of research is really important. How do you see that that's best done? Do you see that through peer-reviewed publication? Do you see that through online reports? It's a huge world out there. Yeah, um, uh, and obviously open access, which I'm sure Nature's very committed to. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> You should hear what I say if you weren't here. <laughs> Please say no, it, I'm a great say it, say it, say um, it. I'll pass um, it back, um, trust thanks, me. Thanks I'm, I'm reporting back to Phil um, after this meeting. So. I, 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 what I meant actually was not about research sharing, although that is a critical component. It's actually beyond the research. It's sharing in the benefits of contributing to that research. The Indonesian Minister of Health, who I would not uh, condone in terms of she was arguing 10 years ago, why should we share H5N1 viruses with you when all you'll do is sell us back the vaccine? Uh, uh, probably quite expensive. No, we have still not, even through IHR and everything else, we have not addressed that fundamental issue at the heart of her argument. And I think we have to. People need to appreciate, it comes back to the incentive point, that if one is willing to contribute, share, etc., there has to be subsequent sharing of the benefits of contributing to that work, including, yes, research, but more fundamentally, uh, sharing the benefits of access to the, ben to the research and where that leads, whether that be to better access to the diagnostics, the drugs, the vaccines, the community in in interventions that are going to make a difference. So I, I don't think you, if we just leave the conversation at sharing data, we will miss the bigger issue, which is sharing the benefits of the data. I'd like to ask you to uh, join with me in thanking Jeremy for a challenging talk.